Sabrina, I'm Diane Gillen. So, um, as Adele said, I'm a psychologist in Beaumont Hospital. Uh, so, I'm very conscious of time, and I'll, I'll, I'll be very mindful of the very good policy uh, earlier on today. So, I'll notice the red dress floating towards me. <laughs> so, just to see what. Okay, so three. Okay, I'll keep an eye on my watch here. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll go through a little bit of data just on well-being and epilepsy and then some strategies around resilience. That'll be applicable not just to people with epilepsy, but to anyone who goes through uh, adversity in life. Okay, now. That button. Okay. So I suppose just to start with, you know, even from ancient times, there's been a link between epilepsy and emotion. Uh, this is Hippocrates, the father of medicine, who before... Uh, Jesus Christ was even born, which I always think is amazing, you know, the sense of scale of time and these problems been around for, for millennia. But he, even he was noticing a link between epilepsy and emotional uh, disturbance. Um, and that's kind of what I'm focusing a little bit on today. So how prevalent then are mental health uh, difficulties in epilepsy? So it's quite complicated, I suppose. There is a lot of research done on this, and studies would say that anxiety and depression would be the most common mental health uh, disorders in people with epilepsy. Uh, it can be tricky too, because these can occur at different times, uh, depending on seizures. So for example, some people will only have um, emotional disturbance in terms of directly related to their seizure. So some people might have We'll say a few hours uh, or days of low mood or irritability uh, or fear or anxiety prior to seizures. And as some of you will know, some of that can be just a general feeling of not being themselves, feeling malaise or unwell uh, prior to a seizure. And that's all they might have. Uh, or they might have um, emotional like mood disorder or anxiety after a seizure. And then fine for the rest of the time. And then there are other people who have, we'll say, mood and anxiety issues in between the seizures. So they're not directly related to the seizures. These are something that happen separately or, or independently. And some people have a combination, as you might know, of all of these things as well. So in terms of actual numbers and research then, um, so if you look at here of what I've uh, highlighted here in blue, we'll say up to a third of, this research would say that up to a third of people with epilepsy can have any uh, mood or anxiety disorder uh, in their, uh, at a certain point in time. And this research then would compare people with epilepsy with people from the general population. So while one fifth of the general population could have mood or anxiety disorder or psychosis or suicidal ideation, uh, that's directly compared to slightly higher rates than in epilepsy. Again, you know, it's, it's, it's a tricky picture. Some of this uh, depends on the type of epilepsy. Some of these issues will be a little bit more frequent in temporal lobe epilepsy. So why is that? Because my love, I spent ages looking for lovely pictures of the brain with colours uh, to show because I do a lot of this in, in work. So this pink part and purple part here, so these are the parts of the limbic system in the brain, so the amygdala, hippocampus, and in temporal lobe epilepsy they can be uh, disrupted or dysfunctional, and they're the emotional centers of the brain. So that's why these uh, emotional issues can be a little bit more frequent in that type of epilepsy, okay? Um, and as well to say, the ILAE have looked at, I came across this article talking about undiagnosed uh, depression and epilepsy as well. So quite a nice little diagram here showing, so in the light green, the people with epilepsy, here in the lighter blue, so the numbers with depression, so about a third uh, according to this study, and then the ones they feel are undiagnosed, so that's quite a, a large group. And this article was generally advising neurologists to be mindful and screening for mood disorders uh, in clinic. And so how do neurologists screen for that? So these are the kind of symptoms, I suppose it's important to say as well, you know, the mood can occur on a spectrum, so we all have bad days feeling disillusioned and sad, and that's part and parcel of life. But for things like, we'll call it, say, major depression, that's a mood disturbance where the mood is so low that it goes on fairly persistently and pervasively. So a couple of weeks at a time where symptoms like feeling everything is a struggle, hopelessness, feeling frustrated, um, that is really difficult to shift. 
Um, what makes it different then from normal sadness or difficulties in life? It's the severity and the impact. So uh, we'll say clinical depression would be something where it's interfering with day-to-day -day life. So it's causing problems and people trying to go to their job, uh, college, to work, function at a day-to-day -day level. So that would be the difference. Um, anxiety can be pretty prevalent in epilepsy as well. So these studies would say between 11 to 50% of adults would experience some kind of anxiety. Now, the reason they give lots of different rates is because different studies use different ways to measure anxiety and depression. Um, so it can be low in some groups, but quite high rates in other groups. And that's relevant too because of the effect of stress in terms of triggering seizures. So what kind of anxiety then would we be talking about that tends to be described in epilepsy? So it's the fear itself of having seizures, something called anticipatory anxiety, where there's that uh, anticipation of having the next seizure, which can be really anxiety provoking. Social anxiety, the fear of having seizures in public, which can be quite impactful on many people's lives. The loss of a sense of control, other people then might experience more generalized anxiety. So not specific to epilepsy or seizures, but these are the people who have constant worry that's very difficult to control. So people who are kind of described as worriers, but to a point where it's getting in the way of living a, a normal life. And then some people might present with a panic disorder. So a panic attack is an intense bout of anxiety where there are palpitations, uh, trembling and, and sweating. Sometimes that can be quite tricky in epilepsy because some partial seizures present that way as well. So that's where the doctors are quite useful in doing a differential diagnosis. Okay, I'll skip through some of the main, um, of the boring slides and get to the more uh, strategies of resilience. Why is it important to talk about these things? Well, it's the impact on quality of life. Uh, some studies would say that actually it's the mood issues uh, more than the epilepsy related factors that impact on quality of life. And again, it's important to emphasize there's such a range and heterogeneous group of people with epilepsy. Some do really well. You know, I've been very inspired by the resilience in many people who uh, are thriving and in, in their lives and managing the challenges. But you have a spectrum. Some people are independent, seizure-free, doing extremely well, all the way to people with very complex and severe epilepsy who then might also have additional difficulties along with that. So it's a very mixed uh, group. Some of the issues then important to quality of life, I suppose the big thing, as you guys will know better than I do, is the restrictions on uh, lifestyle, on jobs, driving being a massive thing, and the emotional impact of that. Um, so I meet a lot of people who, who are being assessed for epilepsy surgery, and it's amazing, which, which, when I started this job, how important driving is and the independence that comes with that. Uh, particularly for people farming, you know, where their whole lives are built around moving machinery and uh, so a massive impact um, of that. And self-esteem issues and stigmatization, which are still unfortunately issues um, among um, people with epilepsy. And these factors also uh, impact on caregivers and family members as well. So there's a lot to consider and a lot of people to consider uh, around the person with epilepsy. So what are the risk factors then for, for mental health issues? There's a lot, so it's not a very simple, like many talks the psychologists do, is it depends, we always say, there's multiple factors that can influence why somebody uh, develops a mood or anxiety disorder. It can be the fact of the epilepsy itself, depending on where it is in the brain. Um, for example, frontal lobe and temporal lobe epilepsy, those front parts and side parts of the brain uh, have emotional centers there so if they're disrupted, uh, it can, that can cause those problems. Equally, there might be additional impacts on adjusting to having a chronic illness. So there's a lot that doctors and psychologists would look at. And very rarely one cause, there's usually a lot. Also to think about the side effects of medication, which I'll touch on a little bit briefly. And it's important to identify the cause, I suppose, because that does impact on intervention. It's just something to say about um, medications uh, in epilepsy, and I'm sure this is relevant not just to epilepsy, other conditions too. Um, so as with uh, all medications, they're positive and negative. So 
I'm not an expert on medications as I'm a psychologist, but I suppose it's very, um, we have to be aware of these and these have bigger impacts on some people than on others. Some people have no side effects whatsoever and don't notice any of these issues, which is great. Um, so in terms of, you can have, I suppose specifically, I'm talking about mood effects from some medications. So there are some like Topamax and Keppra with, with well-known um, mood implications like irritability or low mood. But some of the medications also have positive effects on emotions, like the ones I've listed here, some of which are mood stabilizers and so, anyway, and some which um, have a beneficial impact on anxiety. So they kind of have a positive impact too, which is quite helpful. And again, I suppose this slide is just recognizing the mix of people. So those that um, are very resilient and have a very good quality of life, all the way down to, all the way down to those that have multiple care needs, uh, where they have much more challenges uh, to work through. So a couple of signs of stress to look out for would be feeling moody or irritable. That's quite persistent, I suppose, uh, and difficult to shift over time. Isolating oneself, feeling resentful, or being excessively distracted. So that's um, staring off into space, but like doing that on a pretty prolonged basis where the mind is basically protecting itself from overwhelming um, stressors in the environment. And some physical signs. I know myself, I feel I experience stress quite physically. So when I'm stressed, usually my stomach is in knots, you know, or I feel quite tense. And that can sometimes be a sign to watch out for in terms of stress. So aches, pains, digestive issues. So when I own my stomach's in knots for weeks, I better look at my stress levels, you know. So some people do experience it very physically. So what about COVID then and uh, the impact on mental health? So this was a very interesting paper I was looking at uh, in the last week preparing for this talk where that was published showing there was a significant psychological impact of COVID uh, on well-being. So I was looking at this study. Some Irish people have taken part. So some of you might be uh, in this room. Uh, and one of the key issues they brought up was accessing healthcare professionals. Uh, and as it says here, accessing psychology. Now that's a whole other talk I could talk about in terms of mental health services here in Ireland and access to that. Uh, but even, in, it's not just in Ireland, in Scotland, both people with epilepsy and their caregivers would have said a huge impact on mental health. And actually 80% in the Scottish study found that restrictions due to COVID and just COVID itself had an impact on their overall well-being. So it's important to really acknowledge that. And I suppose one of the key issues uh, in terms of emotional well-being is that epilepsy for many is a chronic condition and it's the day-to-day -day or the year-on-year -year adjustments to make. So there's good times and there's bad times for some people and a lot of adaptation uh, is required. That can be quite interfering with uh, life plans. Another thing too is sometimes unlike other physical conditions, you know, some people might experience that, which you look great, you know, because there's an invisibility about neurological issues. You can't necessarily see them on the outside. Um, people might not necessarily see that the struggle that can be there for some people. And also to bear in mind the cognitive difficulties. So that's a lot of my job is assessing memory and concentration uh, in epilepsy. Uh, some have no issues, no difficulties at all, uh, but others would have significant issues, particularly with will say memory. These will be the most common ones that we come across. And um, so memory issues, particularly in temporal lobe epilepsy, for some people, uh, attention and concentration issues. Another very common one is word finding issues. So that's when you're saying, you know, the, the thing and the thing over, that thing over there, difficulty finding the right word. And again, it's important to remember that actually sometimes it's the medication that contributes to this. It's not just uh, seizures that can uh, influence um, these cognitive issues. And the important thing is like where the seizures are coming from. That's the important factor. Uh, again, many people with epilepsy don't notice any of these issues and don't have them. Um, but it might depend on where in the brain uh, the epilepsy is coming from. Okay, so what, so let's move on to the resilience. So what do we do when we have uh, mental health issues? So as I said, I could do another talk on access to mental health issues. So 
I work as a neuropsychologist in Beaumont, uh, along with two other colleagues, and we do see a lot of people with um, emotional difficulties uh, in epilepsy. And sometimes that might be adjustment, and we might do some therapeutic work around that. Unfortunately, there's only a few of us, and there's a lot of people who might require care in that sense. So what is the most important thing? I suppose in terms of mental health, seizure control is really important, obviously getting that right, and getting the balance right between medications, the side effects, and the positive impacts of that, and how that interacts with mood or anxiety issues. Timely and accurate diagnosis is obviously really important, probably not always happening, um, unfortunately, and wait lists and all of that can really adversely impact that. And I suppose, well, just to go back of a slide there I'd meant to put in around, sometimes psychology is a useful intervention, um, but one of the big frustrations for us, particularly in Beaumont, is uh, looking for supports in the community around mental health. So we've heard of wait lists for two years waiting to see somebody, whether it's in the child services or adult services. And then sometimes even to access that, you have to have quite severe mood and anxiety disorders. So there can be a gap then for people who are just struggling on a day-to-day -day level, not just with epilepsy, but with any other issue. And that's always a huge source of frustration. Um, but today I'm going to talk about what we can do ourselves to manage uh, challenges. So keep that a little bit positive. Self-management is a huge thing, um, a huge concept in a lot of chronic conditions. And there's a lot of groups out there. I know Epilepsy Ireland has its own STEPS program, which is a fantastic resource for looking at stress management techniques. And you're going to be doing a lovely mindfulness exercise before leaving here today. And looking at ways of managing seizure triggers and maximizing lifestyle issues to improve uh, well-being. But then just to get on to resilience. So what is that? So this is the capacity to recover quickly from difficult situations. So the ability to cope with whatever life throws at you. And that applies to us all. Um, so a resilient person is someone who works through challenges by just using their own personal strengths or abilities to get through challenges, um, not just surviving, but thriving. So important to say though, as well, being resilient doesn't really mean that stress doesn't impact you. Of course it impacts us all. But it just means being able to overcome and try to adapt to changes. So there's an important element of flexibility there in trying to navigate difficult life situations. So this is quite a nice uh, little scale I sometimes use um, uh, at work to measure resilience levels. So these are some of the qualities of resilience. So this is a scale that asks how resilient uh, is the person. And here are some of the, it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, do I tend to bounce back quickly after hard times? Um, does it take me long to recover from a stressful event? Is it hard for me to snap back when something bad happens? Or does it take a long time to get over setbacks? And it gives a score there as well in terms of um, averaging out the number and seeing where we fall. Are we low in resilience or high in resilience? So I can make these slides available afterwards if people want to do a little bit of exercise separately on that. So how do we build resilience is the important thing then. So one important strategy that's often talked about in this literature is managing our physiology. So as I said, I'd be somebody who, who's experienced it quite physically. This would be an important strategy for people uh, with similar responses to stress or anxiety. So there are techniques like muscular relaxation, um, ones that you can do on an app or on a website, and I'm going to show you the Beaumont website where we have exercises to do that. I suppose the point is there are certain exercises to help relax the body because it's very difficult to have an anxious mind in a relaxed body. And this technique is used a lot, particularly in anxiety disorders and in panic uh, difficulties, and just for stress generally. So. I, when I was younger, I used to be extremely nervous giving presentations. Thankfully, not anymore, as you can tell. <laughs> but, what, but, but one of the techniques I found really useful was, and I thought it was really odd at the time, was to be really relaxed on a chair. So to almost just sit like this chap. Now, I mean, 
that's quite hard to do in public. I was kind of saying to the lecturer at the time, if I looked like that, it looked like it would, it's not a good look. Um, but what they were, make, they were saying is it's actually very hard for your mind to be stressed if your body is quite relaxed. Now, it can be easier said than done. It's very easy to say, relax your body. It's not always that easy to do. Um, for some people, it's exercise, and there's a huge value in that in any activity, because exercise even has its own the release of endorphins, your natural, um, we'll say, happy hormones, those ones that help reduce stress naturally. So any activity that re reduces muscular tension has a positive impact on stress levels. Especially if you're, if you're one of these people who quite, feels quite tense with stress and quite physically um, on edge. So this is the Beaumont website, and um, we try to market this a lot. There's a lot of really good relaxation exercises on this and mindfulness ones as well. Um, and there's a list to choose from for so people who have difficulty with sleep. So what I'm going to do afterwards, I was thinking, was um, how to share these with people who are interested in these techniques is to create a, a Dropbox and a link to it. So I'm going to put a lot of resources in that folder, as well as links to different services if people are interested in that. And we could share that maybe afterwards. And you're going to be doing a mindful scan uh, today, so you'll have practical experience of that. And some people find these are really helpful in terms of getting to sleep, feeling a little bit less on edge during the day. Another key to resilience is problem solving. So I was reading, I was at a conference a few weeks ago and I was reading about research that talked about the impact of an optimistic outlook. And that research was saying that actually some older adults were half as likely to develop, to develop heart failure compared to less optimistic people. So essentially people were living longer with more optimistic um, outlooks. Again, um, the reason for, for that is that what they were saying was people who are more optimistic tend to be um, people who do more solution-focused thinking. And because of that, they're able to navigate some, some life uh, stressors. So I suppose I find, and one of the studies actually said that uh, women, over an eight-year period, women were 30% were less likely to die from heart disease. So I need to check this, but it's quite impressive in terms of Again, I wouldn't, um, these are only two studies, but I suppose there's a lot of research that would endorse the positive impact of mental well-being on your physical uh, well-being. I've just included some tools then in terms of um, problem solving. Um, but I have to say, you know, in, in my work with people with epilepsy, I've come across some uh, people who do this naturally. They don't, extremely good problem solvers who've embraced the issue and, you know, who show amazing resilience um, without having come into any of these lectures, which is pretty impressive. So this is a slide I use for people who are quite low in mood. So what can I do when I feel really down? So sometimes when people with, with depression, it's very difficult to just generate the energy to do something. And so what I say is sometimes, or what any psychologist would say, sometimes it's around just breaking down the problem into smaller bits and just doing one thing, and even doing it badly rather than anything, than not at all. And as a way of trying to um, make life situations more manageable. For some people, it's doing a to-do list just to break it. Okay, what can I actually achieve today? And just get that piece done and forget about the rest until tomorrow. So some really useful techniques out there to try and help. So one of my favorite slides, I put a lot of work into this one, is... Um, I suppose, looking at how we think. So there's some really inspiring work out there in the resilience uh, literature on the importance of how we think and how that impacts on our moods. So people might have heard of CBT. I don't know if uh, has anyone heard of that. Yeah. So that whole therapy is based on the idea that people with, who are depressed or anxious, a lot of that is influenced by how we think about the world and about ourselves. And that the therapy helps you change that, change how you think about yourself, how you think about the world, in order to feel better. So they would say that a lot of us have unhelpful thinking habits um, that are making life more difficult uh, for themselves, for ourselves. And I'll come on to that in a second. But before I get to that, just to show some really useful um, literature that is very inspiring. So. Uh, I don't know if anyone has, this is one of my favourite movies, The Shawshank Redemption. Has anyone seen that? 
Yeah, anyone not like that movie? So what's amazing about that, and he makes the same point, I suppose, as these guys. This is um, about hope and the value of hope. So this uh, particular work here, Man's Search for Meaning, that was written by Viktor Frankl. Has anyone come across this? I see some nodding, yeah? So pretty amazing story. This, this was a, a psychiatrist who experienced Auschwitz and his, where his whole family uh, were taken away, were killed, and he had a hor horrendous time. He was a psychiatrist, and he wrote this book um, when he came out. And essentially, the point he was making was that there's a possibility of finding meaning in suffering. So he was able to survive by changing how he, think, how he thought about things. So his point was that, you know, you can have everything taken away from you, you can be in a really horrible situation, but the one thing that's always left is your freedom to choose how you think. And he decided to, his way of surviving was to focus on meeting his wife again. He had one purpose and that kept him going um, and allowed him to survive. And he developed a whole therapy around that and finding meaning in small things. So the reason that Robin, does anyone know what the reason that Robin is on the book there? I was trying to Google this yesterday. I think it was, I think it was, I read this years ago. He, in the concentration camp, obviously during a very difficult time, he just spotted this Robin on the fence. And in the midst of all the gray, it was that one small thing that gave him that sense of hope. So he got huge meaning from that around there is something worth living for. So really, really inspiring, a fantastic book if anyone hasn't read that. And all of these other books and works of literature are similar in terms of how far you can go with hope and the importance of that. Now, I was going to play a clip from the Shawshank, which I actually love, but in the interest of time, I probably won't, because I know I'll see a red dress floating towards me. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but there it is anyway, and I'm sure you've all seen that clip. It's the one where he plays the music, you know, he plays the opera music. Um, for all the other prisoners, he breaks in and plays that in defiance of the authorities. And then he's put in the hole for two weeks. Um, and he says when he comes out, this is the, the scene where he's talking to his fellow prisoners, that the one thing that got him through that punishment of being in solitary confinement was the music. So he was saying, they can do anything to me. I can't change my environment, but I can change how I think and what I focus on. And it was a beautiful piece of music. And even something small like that gave him meaning and um, helped him uh, survive uh, that situation. It is a work of fiction, but there's a lot of truth uh, in those themes. And even these famous uh, philosophers and artists talk about the importance of the mind and how we think. So Shakespeare's quote that actually there's nothing either good or bad in the world. It's how we think about it that's important. Uh, so this is um, a little graph I like to use to illustrate that. So you can have three different people looking at the same situation uh, with three different ways of viewing it. And it's the same situation. I won't read that out just in the interest of being appropriate. <laughs> uh, and I think that's important. So what does that tell us about thinking? It means that there are more than one way to view a situation and we can do something about how we think. That's the good news. And as I said, that's the whole premise of this particular type of therapy, is to analyze the way we think and to see is it helpful or unhelpful in terms of the impact on our mood. The idea of CBT is that once, if we can change the way we think about life and ourselves, we can improve how we feel about things. And it is a very effective therapy. Sometimes I do think it's uh, over-prescribed and, but there is a really good evidence base for CBT in mood and anxiety in particular. And we use a lot of that in our own work as well. I won't go through these in detail as I watch my, I'm okay for the moment, I don't see anyone floating. There's a lot of really useful resources. And again, I'll make these available, but some fantastic um, leaflets around trying to identify what are our own thinking habits? Do we have any unhelpful ones? So for example, some people have a mental, oops, uh, some people have, um, particularly with depression, a lot of people with depression have a mental filter and it's very hard to see the positive in things. Um, not everyone, but some people like that, particularly with depression that brings that kind of thinking style out. 
or mind reading. So that would be a thinking style where you might say, oh my God, she hates me, or oh God, they think I'm crap. And you're mind reading, you know, but the important thing about these thinking styles, we don't know we have them or that we're doing them. And we don't know how much they're impacting on our emotional well-being. So you can imagine if I'm going around thinking, oh my God, she hates me, I'm gonna feel very nervous and it's gonna impact on my mood. The whole point of CBT is to analyze our thoughts, say, do we have any of these unhelpful thinking habits and look at the impact it's having on us. We need to become aware of them and we need to modify them and change them and turn them into more balanced and healthy thinking habits. Really useful uh, self-help resource there in CBT. Uh, I use this often at work, not just for patients, but also for family and friends or for colleagues as well. Some really useful techniques in that. And some strategies, like how exactly do I change the way I think? Uh, it depends on which kind of thinking style you have. So one of what I think is common for a lot of Irish people, and I don't know if anyone can resonate with this, is the tyranny of the shoulds. So people who say, oh, I should be doing this. I should be doing that. I, sh oh, I, I shouldn't have done that. I see a lot of um, people with that kind of thinking habit. And what's interesting is they, these people don't realize, and I'm one of them myself, oh, I should have done this. I should have prepared earlier. <laughs> where you don't realize the pressure it puts on a person. So some people walk around with these thinking styles completely unbeknownst to them, not realizing how much pressure and stress that can bring to a person. So CBT is around just recognizing that, challenging those thoughts and replacing them with healthier ones. I'm doing okay for time. So this is, um, there's some specific techniques then depending on the issue. So for the constant worriers, there's quite a number of strategies out there to help with worry. Um, Sometimes it's around what we tell ourselves. So, for example, one thing I used to always use, I thought was really helpful, if I was really anxious about something, I think, is it gonna matter 10 years from now? No one's actually gonna remember this. Say for this talk, if I was really anxious, which I would have been about five or 10 years ago, I would have said to myself, you know what, nobody will remember me. <laughs> this talk won't mean anything in a few. And that actually did help in terms of reducing anxiety. Again, the techniques depend, everyone has their own particular profile, so um, it's around, therapy very often is around working with the individual person to see what works for them. Um, and the worry tree, so I won't go through this in detail, but there's, there's useful strategies to help for, for those people who kind of worry that's out of control, put it that way, around breaking it down and, and learning to make it more manageable. So just to, um, add a few more resources here. These are excellent ones, and I did talks with staff in Beaumont as well on introducing to these, um, the self-help strategies. Really good booklet there on dealing with distress, some fantastic um, uh, techniques in that. And you can always get one specific to mood and stress and anxiety, and these are particularly good ones that are uh, freely available uh, on the internet. So becoming self-aware is quite important. Uh, like I said, in terms of CBT, very often people don't know that the thoughts they're having at the back of their mind have such an impact. And becoming self-aware is, is the key, is the first step. And I think, which is relevant to people with chronic conditions, including epilepsy too, is the idea of acceptance. So sometimes there are situations that we can't change. And then, there's a decision around, well, what I love about this worksheet is it works through that. Okay, this is a stressful situation. And it teaches you to work through, okay, what am I reacting to? Do a bit of self-awareness around that. What am I feeling? Why does this bother me so much? And then there are three options. Well, is there something I can do to change the situation? Very often there isn't. So then it's a choice between, well, do I accept or let it go? And sometimes there's a whole other therapy that's built on the idea that Sometimes the reason people struggle in life is because they hold on to beliefs, okay, life should be a certain way. It should be fair, and then it isn't. And there's a difficulty in accepting that. Some of these strategies would say, sometimes it's rather than fighting that and hoping that, or being very upset that life isn't a certain way, that acceptance, and that's not easy um, in any stretch of the imagination, but sometimes learning to accept it allows us to move on faster than struggling with the way things are. And mindfulness is built around that too. So the 
key quote there is sometimes you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to, to surf and to adapt uh, to that. So these are strategies in those self-help books um, for people who think that might be of use. I actually really like this. This is the Serenity Prayer, and I love the idea in that in sometimes what you want is this, it's around acceptance, the things you cannot change, having the courage to change the things you can, and then I think the, this is the, the hard part, is the wisdom to know the difference. Well, what can I change? What can I not change? But I do really like this. It's something I use myself in terms of managing stressful situations. Um, and there's a real truth in that. Uh, a really useful app I came across as well is called the Happy Feed app. So linking with other talks on apps. So this is around charting good things that have happened. So you can put in pictures of, you know, positive things, reminding yourself of all the positive things that have happened. So it might be a walk on the beach. So I put in one before a walk on the beach in Malahide to remind myself that was a really good um, moment. And you can chart those moments and update your app with that. And for some people, they find that really helpful in being able to think about other things, to remember all the really good things that have happened and to keep a record of them. Because sometimes we forget. Um, all the things that have been really meaningful and um, helpful to our well-being. And being assertive, I know, I know for a lot of patients that I come across, no matter what the condition, whether it's epilepsy or anything else, a lot of it's around not being assertive enough. So some people, I think a lot of Irish people too, were so nice, you know, we're, we might get treated quite badly, but they'll smile and kind of accept, and, oh, it's fine, it's fine. It's not fine, you know. And we're not very good at saying, you know what, that's not fine actually and being assertive and I find as well and this is a common experience that most people assume being assertive is actually quite aggressive uh, where it actually isn't but it's a very difficult thing to be assertive if it's not in your in your nature you know uh, even for myself you know like you know if my neighbor parks in front he's not here hopefully parks in front of my house and um I, was, I should go out now he's done it twice or three times I'll go out and say it but then I think it's been aggressive. And I have to remind myself, no, that's not aggressive. That's being assertive and it's healthy. And you should be assertive. Because otherwise you're carrying that anger and resentment. Uh, I should check who's online and make sure nobody living near me is on there. <laughs> it was a joke if you are. <laughs> I suppose finally just to look how well I'm doing. No one's come near me. and I'm... So one of the most important things I think in terms of stress and, and resilience is the relationships we have with others. So one of the really wonderful things about these kind of conferences is people coming together um, with similar experiences, sharing that with others, and there's a huge amount of support that goes with that. Uh, and there's a lot of research to talk about the impact of social support and how that helps you address uh, stress. So especially if you're isolated, um, it's a massive thing to have somebody you can confide in or to even practical support, it doesn't have to always be emotional support. But one of the, and I will share this because I have found this so helpful, this is one of the best books I have come across um, in terms of strategies for dealing with people. Personally, I don't know if people agree, sometimes I find the biggest stress is managing other, is dealing with other people. Um, dealing, and people might say, I'm the difficult one, so that's always worth <laughs> bearing in mind. But there's really good stuff on how to deal with difficult people people who are passive aggressive, who are stubborn, critical, uh, chronic complainers. I'm not going to name anyone. <laughs> um, but some of the strategy in this, I actually learned quite a bit um, when I came across this book. This book was published in the 80s. And I still think it's one of the best ones in terms of strategies. Okay, how do I deal with this person because they're driving me crazy and it's causing me an awful lot of stress. And they give actual techniques. So I won't go through all of them. But I think for people who can think of somebody or numbers of people in their lives right now that are really, really causing them difficulties, this is a good resource to figure out, well, how exactly am I going to manage them and uh, overcome that issue and get around them? Again, for managing, so something that inc can impact our resilience is um, relational issues with other people. So difficulties in communicating is a massive thing. And this is a really, this book has really good stuff around how do I improve, how do I deal with those communication issues so that person isn't talking to me or I can't really understand what's going on with them. 
there are strategies you can use to overcome that and to improve communication, uh, which I think is great. So let me just go through one. Um, the disarming technique. So this is great. When somebody's, t when somebody's telling you something that you think oh, that's completely wrong, completely unreasonable, rather than say that, which is not conducive to a good relationship, but it, rather than saying, okay, well, I think you're bonkers, that's absolutely not the case, is to try and find some truth and say something like, oh, okay, well, actually, you know, there's some truth in that bit that you were saying earlier, you know, but overall I wouldn't agree. So finding a way, so you disarm them by agreeing to some of it, but not all of it. Um, so really good tricks there in terms of being able to, to manage communication issues, um, which I have shared with a lot of people. So I'll sum up, so I'll leave on these few slides a summary of what I've gone through in terms of ways of building resilience. But I will say that a lot of people I've met have natural levels of resilience, and it's been quite inspiring, and particularly in terms of working with people with epilepsy and their caregivers. Um, it's amazing to see all the challenges, practical challenges, appointments, scheduling, medication, managing seizures, emotions on top of that, all of these things, and to see them um, make their way through those challenges and thrive in a lot of cases. Uh, but as I said, for other people there are quite there is quite higher rates of mood and anxiety disorders and it's important to capture that and to make sure those are managed as well because they have huge impacts on quality of life okay so i'm going to so i so I have a lot of resources on these slides so particularly ones related to epilepsy ireland specific to epilepsy how to tell others about having epilepsy um, specific issues so i've listed them all out here where that's worry self esteem issues depression these are all really good resources. And I think what I'll do is, um, if people are interested, create that online resource and put all of this into that, including contact details for relevant support services, uh, if that's of interest. So have I actually finished early? I have. <laughs> I wasn't here this morning, so I don't know if I'm winning the, if I've beaten, thank you. <laughs>